So in this section, we're going to be looking at politics and economics in the 70s, basically. But in order to get to the 70s, we're going to go ahead and have to look at how this president came into effect, but he came in in 1968. The election in 68, specifically, was against Nixon and Hubert Humphrey and maybe some competition from Wallace. This was covered in the last chapter. Nixon wins on a platform of removing the United States from the Vietnam War, which helped him to win. And you guys can go ahead and look at that picture to the right and see exactly the breakdown of how these um, electoral votes were won. The Southern strategy. Typically, the South would vote Democrat. Uh, remember all the racism out of the Southern Democrats from the last chapter that continued on through this era due to the Democrats being pro-segregation and against civil rights. Nixon vowed to place a Southerner in the Supreme Court. Thus, white Southerners voted for Nixon. This strategy extended beyond the election when Republicans tried to keep the Southern voters. To do this, Nixon showed the civil rights policies going, uh, going against his party because the Republicans were pro-civil rights. The law and order president, he pledged that under his administration, we shall reestablish freedom from fear in America so that America can take the lead of reestablishing freedom from fear in the world. Nixon attacked the Supreme Court rulings that gave criminals expanded rights against the uh, victims. New federalism. Moving power from the federal government back to the states. Remember, the federal government is, are the people that make the decisions in Washington, and they are very far away from you here in Nevada. This is the idea that agencies would be closer to the people. How can Washington, D.C. know it is really happening in Nevada or Las Vegas? Thus, the federal funds would be passed down to the states or local governments. Sadly, the consequences to this is that the states become dependent on federal money, like an allowance you can't live without even when you move out of your parents' home. Nixon often refused to work with Congress. Well, that obviously doesn't work very well. Family assistance plans. Nixon wanted to reform welfare. The aid to families with dependent children, you can see the initials there, was argued to keep people from working by paying them more than a low paying job. So if we continuously help the welfare people, they would not get off welfare because they would get enough money to stay at home. That was the uh, resistance to this particular plan. For a single mother, prospects were worse trying to pay for daycare. In 1969, Nixon proposed the family assistance plan. This plan gave $1,600 per year to supplement the family income and encourage employment beyond welfare. People on welfare complained it was too low and it was therefore defeated. So you can see Nixon was trying to use welfare to the benefit of the entire country, but of course sometimes things just do not work out. Now Nixon had to have a foreign policy. As we always look at presidents, we need to see how they interact with governments across the world. Nixon and Kissinger. Kissinger was the former Harvard professor that had fled Germany in 1938 to escape the Nazis. You can see his picture there to the right wearing glasses. He helped to formulate Nixon's foreign policy, how the country deals with other countries. These two agreed on many points, including slow withdrawal from Vietnam. The big difference was their approach to communism. They decided to work with communists through negotiations instead of against them. The establishment of detente. Detente is the easing of hostilities, strained relations, especially between countries. Though Nixon was known as an anti-communist, he worked for the U.S. to understand the world as less of two countries in charge and more of other countries growing power. So examples of that would be China, uh, Japan, and Western Europe. So Nixon visits China, and you can see many pictures here regarding that, and that was a huge, big issue at the time. Secret negotiations between Kissinger and Chinese leaders led to Nixon visiting China in 1972. This was a big deal because China is communist. The point of the trip was to normalize relations between these countries. Think about it. All of the things that you have that say made in China, maybe those things wouldn't be here. For the good or for the bad, they might not have been here if not for um, Nixon. U.S.-Soviet tensions ease, and those Soviets are, of course, the USSR. After Nixon went to China, the Soviets wanted a summit with him as well. A summit is a meeting. In May of 1972, Nixon went to Moscow, which is the capital of the USSR. From this meeting, SALT, a strategic arms limitation treaty, talks began. Think of a gang war warfare. The USA and the USSR were, were these gangs. They had built up so many weapons, the world would be blown up many times over. Salt were the negotiations to reduce these nuclear weapons. 
This helped the world feel better about peace. Unfortunately, Nixon had, or Nixon had a bit of an Achilles heel, and that might have been paranoia. And so you see this place over here to the right. It's a place called the Watergate, the roots of Watergate. You have probably heard the term Watergate before. It is the name of a hotel and condos. The scandal of Watergate is the cover-up, not the crime of breaking in. The Democratic National Committee had offices there. So Nixon had his enemies, quotes, Nixon was resentful of his critics and started an enemies list of people that he felt threatened from. Again, that would be a being a bit paranoid. Mounting a re-election fight. He was, the first elect, he was first elected in 1968. He was to be re-elected in 1972 after China and USSR visits made him look pretty good. In 72, he ran against George Wallace, who was an independent, uh, had been shot and left, to run, and, and left to run for president. Vietnam was still hurting Nixon. He decided to spy, uh, spread false rumors and reports. On June 17, 1972, five Nixon supporters broke into the Watergate DNC office to obtain, which is steel, campaign information and plant bugs, which are listening devices. The White House staff claimed no knowledge of this crime. Documents showed otherwise. And thus the cover-up begins. As questions about President's involvement began, incriminating documents were destroyed and false testimony was given. Important. President Nixon may not have ordered the break-in, but he ordered the cover-up. The details, or excuse me, the denials continued through the summer, and Nixon convinced enough Americans that he wasn't lying to be elected president. And so you can see that great cartoon to the right. It's strange. They all seem to have some connection with this place. And, of course, those are the feet of the people um, that broke into the DNC. And you can see all of the people involved in the White House or involved in Watergate down below. <clears throat> so you can look at these pictures while I read the cover-up unravels. Nixon was re-elected in 1972 to be inaugurated in 1973. The first cracks show. Trials began in 1973. James McCord agreed to cooperate with the Senate committee and the grand jury, which means his testimony led to more confessions, which means the White House and campaign officials were linked to Watergate, which meant John Dean of the White House staff links Nixon to Watergate. So the dominoes have fallen, and you can see all those dominoes right there with, those, with the arrows. A summer of shocking testimony. John Dean testified that the Attorney General, John Mitchell, ordered the break-in and that Nixon helped with the cover-up. Eventually, Alexander Butterfield said that Nixon had recording system in the White House. These tapes, uh, to explain everything in the Senate, could get them. The case of the tapes. Nixon cited executive privileges. So there are these tapes. He doesn't want to give them up. He's saying that because of executive privilege, I don't have to give them up. To refuse to turning over the tapes, he felt White House conversations should remain confidential, which is private. Meanwhile, the vice president had to resign over bribes from when he was a governor. This is bad in 1973 for Nixon. So Nixon resigns. By April of 1974, Nixon gave prosecutors edited tapes, which means parts were cut out. And you see that cartoon in the upper left, which, which is about that. They said that they wanted unedited tapes. Six days later, the White House Judiciary Committee voted to impeach Nixon. He was charged with obstruction of justice. August 9, 1974, Nixon resigned the presidency, the first president to do so. The impact of Watergate? Well, <clears throat> the new vice president, Gerald Ford, took power after the resignation. That's kind of what happens in the balance of power or in the line of power. The Federal Campaign Act amendments limited campaign contributions and the Ethics in Government Act required financial disclosure by the high government. Officials in all three branches of government. Six weeks after the new president, Ford, was sworn in, he pardoned Nixon for any crimes and he that he had committed while in office. Some of Nixon's aides were not so lucky. So now we move on to the Ford administration. Ford kind of by default, he just fell into the job in a way. The U.S. experienced uh, prosperity in the 50s and 60s due to the availability of raw materials and strong manufacturing. By the 70s, things had to change, with the rising cost of oil slowly slowing the industry and inflation. A mighty economic machine slows. President Johnson, a Democrat, increased spending without, an incre without increasing taxes. 
The taxes are actually how you pay for this, so it's like getting a big house without a job. This caused inflation, an increase in the price of goods. American reliance on oil was fine until the rising cost of oil, which is a raw material, by OPEC, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Company, threw the economy into a decline. The U.S. supported Israel in a war, upsetting Arab nations, who put an embargo, which meant they stopped shipping oil to the United States. So we had a stagnant economy. Factories built at the end of World War II were in need of repair, and new production concepts from Japan were more efficient and cheaper. Manufacturing was sent abroad, and unemployment rose. Due to inflation, goods, stuff you buy at Target, etc., were expensive and unavailable. To slow purchasing, Nixon raised taxes and tried a 90-day freeze on wages and prices. Uh, this did not work. Ford takes over. So Nixon resigned in 1974 and his vice president takes over. Ford pardons Nixon, as we discussed before. September 8, 1974, this allowed Nixon to avoid prosecution, which means going to jail. Nice. Ford tries to whip inflation, and that's the term he used. By 1975, America was in a deep recession. It's a decline in activity across economic economy lasting longer than a few months. His plan to fix this was to whip, whip inflation now. His foreign policy, well, is a little lacking. His, for, his policy was basically Nixon's policy. He established a Helsinki Accord in NATO. He was like a lame duck president for three years. And you can kind of see the line of events down there that caused some of these things to happen. And so we will now move on to the next slide. And so with this slide, I just kind of want you to see the presidents and their wives as going through the 70s and then, of course, into 1980. The election in 19... So the wives of the presidents, Pat Nixon, born in Ely, Nevada. So she collected historical items from the White House. Betty Ford raised breast cancer awareness, supported ERA and abortion. She was an alcoholic and addicted to opioids. And so that's where the um, she founded the Betty Ford Clinic. Rosalind Carter, she also supported mental health research. She was a mother to a child in the White House. And you can see the last presidents, well, not really. Ronald Reagan was elected in 80 and took office in 81. In the 76 election against Ford Dole and Carter Mondale, Carter won the election. America had been in a recession with poor foreign relations and the U.S. wanted to change the problems of Nixon and Ford. I mean, it was kind of an embarrassment to the world. Ford was not a dynamic speaker and Carter represented change. Have you heard that before? So, Carter battles for economic crisis. Carter's domestic uh, U.S. borders, inside the U.S. borders, planned uh, plan the economy. He, ref he used increased government spending to create jobs, but inflation surged. They delayed, then delayed tax cuts. The war against consumption. Carter wanted to reduce oil use. He created the Department of Energy in 1979. Another crisis in the Middle East caused a few shor shortage before it was uh, the war with Israel, if you recall. Carter's leadership problems. Carter was inexperienced at working with Congress. Thus, Congress blocked his proposals. He also did not translate his goals into concrete plans and no identifying theme for his administration. His foreign policy. He did define his foreign policy. He was a Southern Baptist that wanted the U.S. to be right and honest and truthful and decent. Morality and foreign policy. He gave Panamanians control of the Panama Canal by 1999. So he signed it over during his administration and just did not take effect until 1999. He attacked the USSR for its human rights violation, which set back the relationship between the USA and USSR. Then the USSR invaded Afghanistan. Carter placed a grain embargo on the USSR. Grain meaning wheat, you know, stuff like that. And the USSR was incapable of feeding its own people under communism, so it actually, ironically, needed our food. <clears throat> triumph and failure in the Middle East. His success was the Camp David Accords in 1978 between Israel and Egypt. Land on the Sinai Peninsula, seen in the map below, was given to, the e was given to Egypt by Israel, were the results of 14 months of diplomatic efforts by Egypt, Israel, and the United States. That began after Jimmy Carter became president. The efforts initially focused on a comprehensive resolution of disputes between Israel and the Arab countries, gradually evolving into a search for a bilateral agreement between Israel and Egypt. Failures. Just months after his success, the Shah of Iran was overthrown by the Ayatollah Khomeini. That's a religious leader making that land a theocracy. Uh, in November of 1979, Iranians stormed the, uh, the revolutionary and took 52 American hostages. 
Carter even tried to rescue them, but the missions failed. In January of 21st of 1981, the day after Carter left office, the hostages were freed. This is a way of humiliating Carter and by the Ayatollah and giving the power to um, Ronald Reagan. So it's really fun to look at a decade and see what's happening actually with the people in it. And you can see the differences of incomes and birth rates and all that type of stuff going on in below. You gotta love that picture I put in there. A new age movement came about and the transcendental meditation and the changing families. More women were working than ever before. 60% of 16 to 24 year olds. Uh, they had an effect on the family by removing the mother or wife from the families. Many women sought higher education for better paying careers. Birth rate fell due to the pill, which is birth control, and working women. Families spent less time together but had more money to spend. Unfortunately, a recession ha and inflation made home ownership difficult. Owning a TV became common, so more of our car culture was shaped by the TV shows we watched. So I pretty much love this slide, um, you know, the me decade, because I love looking back at these movies and TV shows that I love to watch. So you can see movies and TVs. There are so many to mention, but one of the changing movies was, of course, Star Wars. George, Luke, George Lucas's ability to freeze frame images was literally seemed out of this world was revolutionary. Steven Spielberg created fear of swimming in any body of water with Jaws, and innocent people falling victim to Rogue Shark. Italian Americans were angered by the way they were depicted in The Godfather. Um, it is a violent image of being in an Italian mob. TV shows, the decade opened with Mary Tyler Moore show where Mary, Ty where Mary worked, lived on her own, and never married. Scandalous. She even dated. TV before this showed married women that stayed at home, and of course her and her husband always slept in separate beds. All in the family risked even more social political views. Archie Bunker was the main character with his family. His neighbor was African American George Jefferson, who was so great. Who was so great? He and his wife Wheezy had a spinoff show where they were rich business people breaking another stereotype: the Jeffersons. The N-word was used on this show regularly. Welcome back, Cotter, too, placed in Brooklyn, in New York, and showed a racially and ethnically diverse cast. Um, Cotter, or Cotter, was the teacher that returned to his high school to teach remedial classes. Many more shows that were not controversial or dealt with political issues existed for entertainment, including The Brady Bunch, Charlie's Angels, The Love Boat, Dukes of Hazard, and Fantasy Island. Welcome to Fantasy Island. If you ever saw it, you know what I was doing there. These shows could be looked at as a way of escaping serious social issues of the 70s. And here you can just see a few trends of that me decade of the 70s. Disco music, a combination of pop, funk, soul, and salsa. Best seen when watching Saturday Night Fever with John Travolta. The Bee Gees, who wrote it, are the Brothers Give, performed most of the songs on the soundtrack and became famous for Barry Gibb's high falsetto voice. I should say that higher. The queen of disco was Donna Summer. People began to take dancing lessons to keep up with the trends depicted in the movies or on TV, in shows like Soul Train or American Bandstand. ABBA, Rod Stewart, the Eagles were, uh, were other prominent performers in this deco decade. Earth Day was established. It is an annual event celebrated on April 22nd worldwide. Various events are held to demonstrate support for environmental protection. It marks the unofficial beginning of the environmental movement. John McConnell is listed often as the founder. The environmental movement primarily acted on the federal level, which is the government in D.C., just to remind you. Fads and fashions, aerobics, jazzercise became popular forms of exercise. Meanwhile, people spent money on a rock, yes, known as a pet rock. Who would have thought of that? To figure out how people were feeling, they wore mood rings, and to light up the house while adding atmosphere, a lava lamp was invented. Platform shoes and polyester clothing were the items of clothing worn by many. Polyester was a new combination of man-made fibers that helped to reduce wrinkling and thus made it easier to get ready for work in the morning. Many average people installed CB radios in their cars so that they could say things like breaker one nine and have a handle. Uh, to communicate with others while traveling. There was a movie called Convoy, which depicts this. And there you have this section, which is basically the 1970s.